truly, this man was the Son of God. This is the Roman centurion's confession after what he heard and what he'd seen. Truly, certainly, this man was the Son of God. Whenever I attempt to prepare a message, whether it's Sunday school, um, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, TV, radio, whatever it might be, it is very important to me to know that I have given it all my effort in the preparation of that message. I never want to bring a message where I didn't give all my effort. And Secondly, I want every message to be a message where if someone does not know the way of salvation, the way of grace, when they come in here, they can at least leave having heard the gospel. And with every message that I bring, no doubt I have failed, but with every message I bring, I want to be satisfied that if this was the last message I preached, it'd be all right. And I deeply feel that way about this message. Truly, this man was the son of God. Now, these were the words of the man who presided over the crucifixion of Christ. He was the foreman at that time, giving the other Romans direction as to what to do. Now, two things caused this man to make this confession. Number one, revelation. That's the only way he could know. The same thing could be said of him that was said of Peter. When Peter made that great confession, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to thee. But my father, which is in heaven, if you know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God himself revealed that to you. That's why you know. And that's why this man knew. And he knew because of the things he heard and the things he saw. He heard those seven sayings. From the cross. Oh, what a gospel message each of those sayings are. And the scripture points out in verse 39, and when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out. He so <laughs> cried out. No man ever died like this man. He so cried out. And I think it's interesting that Luke says in his account of this same event, surely this man was a righteous man. Now God the Holy Spirit has that recorded. This man said, surely this man was a righteous man. But I think what's interesting is in the original, the definite article is used. What's a definite article? Well, if I say a Lord, or if I say the Lord, big difference, isn't there? A Lord, there can be many Lords. As a matter of fact, there's one place where Paul says there's God's many and Lord's many in 1 Corinthians. But when I say the Lord, there is only one Lord. This man is the righteous man, the only righteous man 
to ever live. He's confessing the deity of Christ, the Son of God, the humanity of Christ, the righteous man. I love the way Mark's gospel begins, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's the first verse. What a great way to open up that book. And then we have this ending where this Roman centurion makes this confession, surely, certainly, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now let's not forget who this man was, a Roman centurion, the head over 100 soldiers. He was the foreman, as it were, over crucifixions. At this time, crucify so many, this was his job. Any criminal against the state, his job was to make sure they were crucified. He presided over this, crucify so many and get back home in time for dinner with the wife and kids. This was his job. He had presided over many crucifixions, and you can imagine just how desensitized he was toward this. I mean, he'd seen this, seen this so many times, it just didn't mean much to him. Uh, let's get this guy crucified. Let's get this guy crucified. That was his job. I don't know what participation he had in the actual physical crucifixion, but he told them what to do. Was he involved in the mocking? Perhaps. But I... I've already pointed this out. Mark says he stood over against him. Now that word means he was contrary to him. He was against him. He was not for him. But something truly miraculous takes place. A miracle of grace takes place, and this is no less miraculous than that of the thief, and he now knew who this man is. Just like the thief, he went to the cross not knowing who he was. But he found out who he was, didn't he? He's the Lord. He's God. He must be successful. He's going to come back as a mighty reigning king. All he has to do is remember me and I'll be saved. He knew who he was. Isn't that saving faith? This man now knew who Jesus Christ was. The son of God. He's the one. This man is one of the ones that Christ prayed for. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You know what? The Father forgave that man. That man was a saved man. That man had the gospel revealed to him. You know, he'd never seen a man die like this before. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out. And we know what he cried at this time. It is finished. Oh, what blessed words. Nothing for me to do. What about, hold on. It is finished. There's nothing for me to do. He cried as a mighty conquering king. And the scripture says he yielded up the ghost. Now, death doesn't need our permission to take us. But it needed his permission. It couldn't take him until he yielded himself up to it. Perhaps he was stunned by a silence. You know, there's such majesty in a silence at this time. Or perhaps he was stunned by the majesty of his person. He'd never seen strength like this before. Matthew's account says he was watching Jesus, carefully observing him. Now don't forget what this man experienced. He was there 
when the sun stopped shining. Maybe people lit torches. I don't know. But there was thick darkness. And he felt the earth quake at that time. He felt the rocks rent. And Matthew's account says he feared greatly, awed by the majesty of his person. The fear of God, that's the beginning of wisdom. Luke's account said he glorified God in this confession. He went from being a hardened Roman centurion who crucified people for a living to one who feared and glorified God. I want to be one of those people, don't you? I want to be one of those people who fears him and glorifies him, that fear which is the beginning of wisdom. Truly, this man was the Son of God. This man knew who Jesus of Nazareth was. Now, if you would have asked him, if he was saved, he probably would have not understood what you're asking him. If you would have asked him if he were a Christian, he probably couldn't give a positive answer to that. If you would have asked him if he was one of the elect, he probably would have said probably not. If you would have asked him if he had been born again, he would scratch his head, wondering what you were saying. If you asked him, are you growing? What? Are you growing in grace? He couldn't give an answer to that. But if you asked him who this man is, surely, this man is the Son of God. Now this is the son Isaiah prophesied of. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. This is the eternal Son of God. He was born as a child, but he didn't have a point of existence when he began to be. He's the eternal son of God. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is the son of God that Nebuchadnezzar saw in the Fiery furnace in Daniel chapter 3. I love that passage of scripture. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are bound and thrown into a furnace that was so hot that the people who threw them in were burned up. And Nebuchadnezzar looks within that furnace and he said, did we not throw three men bound? Lo! I see four men loose. And the form of the fourth is like unto the Son of God. You see, when he's revealed, you know who he is. You recognize him. And you recognize that which is not him as well, if you know him. Yeah. Here's the issue. John chapter 5, you can turn here if you want, I'm just going to read it. Verse 17, but Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. Notice, my father, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. Whatever he does, I do. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. 
There's only one person who's equal with God. God. No one else can be compared to him. There were two men that had no biological father. The first Adam and the second Adam. Neither one had a physical, biological father. But there is only one who had no point of which he, at which he began to exist. The only begotten Son of God. And understand this, that begetting spoken of is not an event of time that took place. It's an eternal fact. He is the eternal, only begotten and well-beloved Son of God, the eternal I am. Now, listen to this scripture. In the beginning, John 1, 1. In the beginning, that's before creation, that's hard to get hold of, isn't it? A time when there was no time. Eternity. In the beginning was the Word. He was always there. And the Word was with God as a distinct person from God. And the Word was God. God the Son. I love it when the Lord says, What think ye of Christ? What's he say next? Whose Son is he? They answered, The Son of David. Well, the Lord replied, If he's David's Son, why did David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, <laughs> sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. At the announcement of his birth, the angel said to Mary, that holy thing. <laughs> it's almost like even the inspired angels couldn't come up with the right word to call it. That holy thing which shall be born of you, shall be called the Son of God. The only record we have of his youth, he identifies himself as the Son. I must be about my father's business. I'm his son. At the beginning of his public ministry, at his baptism, do you remember the voice that came down from heaven? God speaking this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Oh, the father's pleasure at his son. I think of poor old Peter. And I'm not saying this in any way judgmentally of him. Uh, but he said maybe the most stupid thing ever said on the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw the Lord transformed in his glory and his deity and, and shining and he, his deity burst through his humanity and poor old Peter has to say something. He said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles. Three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Putting the Lord on the same plane as those created men? Well, at that time, the scripture says a bright cloud overshadowed them. And they hit the dirt. And the voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And they didn't say Moses and Elijah anymore, did they? They saw no man save Jesus only. You know, that man possessed with a demon knew who he was. Now, this is somebody God saved, but that man possessed with a demon, when he 
saw Jesus afar off. The scripture says he came and ran and fell at his feet and worshiped him, saying to Jesus, thou son of the most high God, torment, I adjure thee, I beg thee, torment me not. He didn't know the Lord was going to save him. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of... We have no connection. He had no idea the Lord was going to save him. But that's exactly what the Lord did. But, you know, anybody that knows he's the son of God like that, that's somebody God's revealed himself to. When he walked on the water, coming to the disciples during that great storm, and they cried out in fear. And when he came into the boat... And the storm ceased and there was a great calm. They said, truly, this man is the son of God. You see, he did only what God could do. He controlled the weather. I mean, can you imagine somebody that had the power to control the weather? I mean, that can't be duplicated by a mere man, but he could. Peace, be still. And there was a great calm. He brought matter into existence that had not been in the universe before when he created new bread. Only God can do that. He could read men's minds. Lynn thinks she can read my mind, and 9% of the time she can, but not really. I mean, nobody can read somebody's mind. Uh, he could. He knew exactly what every man was thinking. He raised the dead. Only God can raise the dead. Colossians 2, 9 says, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You know, when they refused, uh, they tried to make him king once tried to force him into office, tried to vote him into office. He refused it. He left. He wasn't interested in their uh, affirmation. And at that time, he brought a message that everybody listening got so angry, they left. Every one of them. Every one of them. And I, I can imagine maybe some of the things the disciples were thinking. Do you have to say it like that? Listen, we have some... We're having some interest here. And uh, he didn't ask those people to come back either. When they left, he watched them leave. And he said to the 12, will you also go away? And Peter, here's something glorious Peter said. I know Peter said silly things, but he said the greatest things that have ever been said. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? It's not like we have an option or we have some other way, place to go. Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. You'll remember when the Lord said, Whom say men that I am? And Well, they said things. Some people would have thought they were putting him in good company. Jeremiah, Elijah, one of the prophets, though, those things were derogatory to the Lord Jesus Christ. To call him any man like that is a derogatory slam against him. And it was all contradictory too. Then he said to Peter, but whom say ye that I am? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That's when the Lord said, blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, this confession of who I am, I'll build my church. Now hear his father's testimony. I want to read this in Hebrews chapter 1. You can turn with me there if you want to. But in Hebrews chapter 1, beginning verse 8, this is his father's testimony. But unto the Son, he saith. This is God the Father speaking. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. 
Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. That's what the Father testifies of the Son. Here the Son's testimony. He was talking to that man that he had given sight to. And he said, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe? And he said, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that speaketh to thee. Are you the son of the blessed? I am. The Holy Spirit bore testimony to him when he descended from heaven like a dove and landed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of the way he received worship. What if uh, somebody came up and started kissing my feet and I didn't stop them? What would you think of me? You would think, why, you confounded hypocrite. You're the worst person alive. You shouldn't let anybody do that to you. But when they did it to the Lord, he received their worship. You know why? Because of who he is. He said, you believe in God? You believe God's holy? Believe me. You believe God's all-powerful? Believe me. You believe God is absolutely sovereign? Believe me. You believe God is immutable? Believe me. Whatever you believe concerning God that's revealed in his word, you believe the same thing concerning me. Now let me wrap this up. This Roman centurion confessed at this time the content of saving faith, the content of the gospel, and the content of preaching. First, he confessed the content of saving faith. Now let me make that good from the word of God. Philip has preached the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. He hears what's being said. Don't you love that passage of scripture where he began with that same scripture and preached Jesus unto him. Oh, I would love to have heard that message. And they come up to water. And the Ethiopian eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And he replied, If you believe with all your heart, thou mayest. And what did he say? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. When the Lord told the Gadarene demonic to go home and tell him and his friends and family the great things that God had done, the scripture says he went and told them the great things Jesus had done. In Acts chapter 16, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And the scripture says he believed in God with all his heart. Now, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, it's impossible for you to even think of him not being successful in what he did. 
It can't be done if you know who he is. This, this settles everything. Who he is determines everything else. If he's almighty, sovereign, immortal, eternal God, everything becomes obvious. It's who he is. That is the issue. Who is Jesus Christ? These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life through his name. This is the content of saving faith. Secondly, this is the content of the gospel. Let me show you that in Scripture. Turn with me to Romans 1. I'd like you to look at this with me. Romans 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. The gospel of God is the gospel concerning his son. Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. There's two things that demonstrated his being the Son of God. The only holy man to ever live, he was raised from the dead. That's the content of the gospel. And everything is predicated on who he is. You find out who he is, everything's settled. You know, I think of election. Chosen in him. What is election without Jesus Christ? It's just a, a, a harsh, you, you don't, can't, but boy, chosen in him. Justified by his righteousness. Redeemed by his blood. Given eternal life by him. He said, I give unto my sheep eternal life preserved in Christ Jesus called by his grace you know his person is so glorious that when we shall see him as he is we'll be made just like him that's how glorious he is to see him as he is you'll be turned just like him. So this is the content of faith. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is the content of the gospel. And this is the content of our preaching. Now let me show you that. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 18, but as God is true, our word, our word toward you was not yea and nay. Well, that uh, demonstrates most preaching. Yes and no to the same thing. Is Jesus Christ enough to save you off? Of course he is, but not unless I let him save me. Well, that's yea, nay. That's all it is. It's foolishness. Now look what he says in verse 19. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us. There's our message. The Son of God, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. It's all yea. It's all yes. For all the promises of God in him are yea and amen unto the glory of God by us. Now this is the content of our preaching. And I, 
This is not cliche. We preach a person. The Son of God. Who he is, what he accomplished, and where he is right now, and what he's doing there. Can you say with the Roman centurion, truly, this man is the Son of God? If you can, blessed are you. God revealed this to you. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for the revelation of thy dear son. Lord, we ask in his name that you will be pleased to make him known to everybody in this room for Christ's sake that we all might say with this Roman centurion, truly, this man was and is the Son of God. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Group.